Hello, you seeing it? For the past two years, I've been obsessed with designing and testing improvised smoke devices in various compositions. My goals were threefold. First, to surpass U.S. military standards for signaling and obscuration. Could a civilian or militia effectively use these in an SHTF scenario? Second, to create affordable, low-toxicity options for gameplay, like airsoft, paintball, or just messing around in your backyard. Third, to ensure everything can be crafted at home. No CNC machines, no CAD software, no 3D printers. I'm a fan of those tools, but my projects are all about accessibility. The formulas listed in the left column are the cream of the crop for their categories. A non-toxic screening formula, a mildly toxic combat-only screening formula that'll block out the sun, and non-toxic colored formulas perfect for signaling. Across the top row, you'll see two device design categories budget-friendly gameplay devices, and combat-ready ones that outperform their military equivalents. What follows is a clear, fast-paced, step-by-step guide to building the device that pairs with these formulas. A quick heads up, do not use this design with the TPA formula. It will go boom boom. Well, that's not good. I will pause here so you have time to take a screenshot. These are all of the formulas that this canister works well with. These formulas are also available in the free PDF section of my website. Note that they do not have specific dyes, for example, Disperse Red 9. Instead, they use the smoke dyes available at Fireworks Cookbook, as that is the best source I've found at this time. We start with a canister, a tiki torch can, available in the outdoor department at Walmart for two bucks each. A practical note, Estimate how many you'll need for your project and acquire triple that amount to account for testing and errors. The reaction temperature of your smoke composition determines whether pre-torching is necessary. Pre-torching removes the factory paint which can ignite and cause a fire if your composition burns hot enough to heat the canister. As a guideline, if your oxidizer is potassium chlorate, pre-torching is typically unnecessary. For any other oxidizer, it's recommended. For maximum safety, I advise torching every canister. If you plan to spray paint the finished product after torching, use high temperature spray paint to withstand the heat. Next, use a standard can opener to remove the lid as you would with a can of food. Set the lid aside, we will be using it later. Now we add a 3 8 inch base layer of a heat resistant material. Options include heat resistant epoxy, plaster of Paris, or Durham's water putty. My preference is West System Epoxy Fast Cure mixed with spherical glass beads as a heat resistant thickening agent. While West System is costly, alternatives like Bondo Resin are viable substitutes. I opt for epoxy due to its superior bonding to metal, strength in thin layers, and lack of residual moisture, unlike Plaster of Paris or Durham's, which can seep into the smoke composition and affect performance. 
This base layer serves six critical purposes. First, it provides headspace between the burning composition and the exit orifice, reducing the risk of flare-ups. Second, it maintains the canister's flat bottom during compression of the powdered composition, ensuring a proper fit for the flutter valve and effective waterproofing. Third, it reinforces the canister against bursting from internal pressure. Fourth, it prevents deformation of the exit orifice under high heat and pressure. Fifth, it insulates the thin metal, lowering fire risk. Sixth, it enhances durability against drops onto hard surfaces. When loaded with the doomsday composition, the device weighs one pound seven ounces, and without this reinforcement, the rolled seam could separate if dropped or thrown. Fill the canister with your chosen smoke composition. As you fill, compress the powder incrementally. I use a bench top arbor press with a manual lever rated at 2,000 pounds, though I question that specification. Fill to approximately 3 eighths of an inch below the top rim. Mix in another batch of epoxy, optionally thickened, and pour it over the compressed composition. Tilt the canister circumferentially to ensure the epoxy adheres to the sides. Before it cures, embed the lid we removed earlier into the epoxy, then fill the remaining void around the rim. This lowers the threaded top where the fuse will attach, reducing the device's height and optimizing the fuse and spoon positioning upon assembly. After curing, drill a central hole through the epoxy and composition. I typically use a 3 quarter inch Forzner bit for a clean hole with the Doomsday Mix, as smaller diameters struggle with its volume. In this demonstration, I'm using a 5 8 inch exit orifice for variation. Colored compositions are more accommodating of smaller sizes. The next component is the helical igniter. Begin by cutting a 3 inch wide by 4 inch high piece of 1 quarter inch hardware screen. Roll it around a dowel, matching or slightly less than the diameter of your exit orifice to shape it, then remove the dowel. Take just over a foot of fast burning visco fuse and thread it through the mesh in a figure eight pattern as shown. Prime the sections of the fuse that will contact the smoke composition. I recommend the M83 starter formula bound with nitrocellulose lacquer for optimal ignition. If you prefer simpler options, Alternatives include meal powder or black powder slurry in NC lacquer or PVA glue. A 50-50 mix of potassium nitrate and powdered sugar would also work, or crushed match head compositions with glue. Apply primer sparingly. Excessive amounts increase flare-up risks. Secure the ends of the figure 8 with a wire or small zip tie. Trim one end short, leaving the other approximately 2 inches long for later adjustment. Insert the completed helical igniter into the canister's core. This igniter design offers four advantages. First, the hardware screen supports the composition's open core, preventing crumbling during drops or rough handling. Second, it maintains a clear ejection path during combustion, minimizing ash interference and enhancing color vibrancy by reducing the filtration of the dye before sublimation. Third, it prevents chunks of ash or unburned composition from escaping, reducing fire hazards and maximizing smoke output. Fourth, with fast visco fuse, it ignites the entire core surface from four points nearly simultaneously, ensuring rapid smoke release. For ignition, we use the M228 fuse, a flashbang fuse commonly salvaged from military surplus sources. You can find them on eBay or Amazon. I'll demonstrate modifications for instant ignition in this video, but for those interested in adjustable time delays, a detailed step-by-step -step guide is available as a $3 PDF on my website. Start by sliding out the hinge pin to remove the mousetrap spring and striker. Using an eighth inch black oxide drill bit, drill from the bottom of the fuse upward, clearing out the original time delay debris. As you near the percussive cap, remove the bit from the drill. Place it on a hard surface and tap gently with a hammer to dislodge the cap. A rod or punch is preferable to this savage method. Ideally, use a small primer pocket reamer to clear remaining magnesium, creating a clean pocket for a primer or grommet, as you'll see soon. Approximately mid-spin on the delay tube, use a spring-loaded center punch to mark a pilot hole. Then, drill a 1 8 inch hole across the tube's diameter. This serves to ignite a perpendicular visco fuse in the primer method, which I'm going to show you next, or to vent excess gas in the other technique I'm going to show you.
drill a second hole approximately three-eighths of an inch from the bottom and tap it with a threading for a small machine screw. This is used to secure the fuse in the second method I'm going to show you. The first rearming method uses a primer. With salvaged M228 fuses, mousetrap spring strength varies significantly. Across eight dozen units from various sources, I found primers unreliable despite their simplicity. Install a small pistol primer and prime the midsection of a 1 8 inch visco fuse in contact with ignition gases. To do this, slice the fuse lengthwise, extract the powder, mix it with NC lacquer or PVA glue, apply it to the fuse and let it dry. Insert the fuse and secure it with painter's tape as seen here. In my opinion, this method is better. It uses chemical compositions for greater sensitivity and reliability, plus improved waterproofing. It requires an ignition composition resembling H48 primer mix and a striker composition with red phosphorus. These versatile formulas can rearm M228s, M201A1s, or be adapted for pull cords, impact igniters, and more. Full details are on my channel and in the description. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Another one. <laughs>